I'm Ellen. That's cute. And this is Preston. Welcome to St. Paul's. We're so glad you're here. The congregation is so loving and caring and has been so wonderful to us. We hope you'll join us every Sunday. Have a great day. Good morning, St. Paul's. We are sorry that we are not here live with you this morning, but I have a reunion at my home church that I grew up in every year at Laurel Hill Baptist, and I have kidnapped the praise team to come with me to sing there this morning, but we would like you to still worship with us on the video, and so please stand and join us as we start our service today. My life is in you, Lord, my strength. you pray with me this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come and to worship you. Lord, we pray that this morning you would just empty us completely, that we would be able to hear your words as you speak to us. Lord, just fill us with your presence. Help us to feel the love in this place today, just to be able to worship you, to love you, just to see you more clearly, to learn more about who you are and your love for us. In your name we pray, amen.
Good morning. The scripture reading for today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in saying the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is one of the most important verses in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If we don't believe God is the creator, it makes it really, really hard to believe anything else that comes after. The first verses of Genesis also tell us that before anything else existed, God existed. God doesn't come into existence after creation. He was already there before there was a creation. Everything in existence, everything that had ever, that ever existed, everything that will ever exist is here or was here because in the beginning there was God. And he decided to create everything, including you and me. We're continuing our, our summer sermon series, The Creed, What We Believe. Now, last week we kicked the series off by looking at how the Apostles' Creed is a way for us to learn and teach others about the faith. In the words of Jesus' brother Jude, it's a way for us to contend for the faith in a world of competing faiths and ideas. Next week, we're going to begin looking at Jude's brother, Jesus, and how the creed highlights how Jesus is Lord and ruler of all. But today, we're looking at the first line of the creed that talks about God the Father and how he made everything out of nothing. The Apostles' Creed begins as almost a word-for-word -word statement of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The key difference is that it adds the confession, I believe. The Creed says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. See, that is a foundational worldview statement. Now, a worldview is a set of beliefs about the most important, the biggest questions of life and how those beliefs kind of come together in all of us to form a system, a way of viewing life. All of us have worldviews. We all have a system in which we operate, a philosophy, if you will, from which we, 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 we encounter life, through which we perceive life, for which we interact in life. Uh, most of us, a lot of us, don't even think about it, right? We, we don't sit there and think about our beliefs. Yet your beliefs on the big questions of life often are ha are, uh, form a system that that is how you act. You respond in accordance with your views within that system. So 
When we make the statement that God the Father is the creator of heaven and earth, what we're attempting to answer is is a question, right? We're attempting to answer one of those big questions, uh, the the who am I and why am I here type questions, right? And, and, And there are many different worldviews that are attempting to answer those questions, like most religions are, 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 geared around a worldview and answering the big questions of life. Philosophy, uh, the various competing schools of philosophy, they are all tied together around this idea of these varying worldviews and and, and how we interact with with this world that we're at. at. And so every single one of those is trying to answer the big questions. And then from those big questions, they get a system that tells you how you should live. And so you live in accordance with that worldview. Now, the big question that the creed is attempting to answer for us in that first part has to do with why there is something rather than nothing. Or to put it more simply, how did we get here? Now, there are many different worldview systems as we just said, but the most prevalent in our society today is a worldview known as naturalism. Now, naturalism, simply put, says that nothing exists outside of the material world. So if you think of the material world as kind of like a box, right? Everything that's in the box, well, that's all there is. You can't have anything else. There's nothing else outside of the box. No heaven above or hell below, if you will. You'll notice that John Lennon's Imagine talks about that. You didn't realize it when you're out there, you Beatles fans or you John Lennon fans singing Imagine, but that's what he's talking about. He is espousing in song this worldview of of naturalism. So, so, So how does naturalism? Since, since it's pretty much the prevalent view. And what I mean by when I say it's the prevalent view, I mean that if you go to most institutions of higher learning, uh, most, uh, uh, most secular institutions, quite frankly, all adhere to this idea that you can only deal with the stuff in the box, with the material world, and there's nothing else to tackle, or, or it's not worth tackling at the very least. So, so, so how does naturalism? answer this big question of how we got here. Well, naturalism offers several ideas of how we got here. One of the most popular emerging theories in science, of course, science itself is a discipline that is rife with naturalists, right? A lot of naturalists gravitate towards being scientists. And they have this idea that's becoming more prevalent called panspermia. This is the idea that life originated somewhere else, such as Mars, and was brought to Earth by natural means, such as maybe a comet or a meteor or some space dust from Mars that landed on Earth. Or, of course, what's all the rage now, aliens, right? Like, like, so aliens brought life here to Earth. Now, of course, a problem with this view is it might tell us how life got to Earth, although there's not a lot of evidence for what they're saying. Um, It might tell us how life got to Earth, but it doesn't tell us how life, let's use Mars, for instance. How did life get to Mars? I mean, you would have to assume that if this is panspermia, that it, it came from another planet somewhere by a meteor or a comet or an alien species that brought it to Mars. And so if we take a step to that planet, well, how did life get on that planet to come to our planet? And, and if I take another step back, um, how did it get to that planet? And that planet, and that planet. And you see, and you kept just walking the question back, back, back. This is what's known in philosophy as an infinite regress. And it's, it's, it's a logically incoherent statement. You can't just 
keep going and going and going. There has to be a ground, a beginning somewhere. And so, so that panspermia idea is already in trouble because you just keep walking this idea back that still doesn't answer quite the question. Might answer the question of how we got life on earth. Might answer the question of how life got on Mars. But doesn't how answer, answer the question of how the whole universe came to be and why there's something rather than nothing. Now, indeed, uh, if you naturalists often have another answer that they like to give. And that is when you ask that big question, they say something along the lines of, that's not a really good question, or even that's a dumb question. Uh, if there were no life, they say, then you wouldn't be around to ask the question. So you're alive, therefore live your life and stop asking questions we can't know the answer to. So, so the idea from a naturalist perspective is you can't possibly ever know the answer to that question. So why bother even asking the question? The fact of the matter is we're here and we should celebrate that fact because if we weren't here, we wouldn't be around to ask questions about whether we were here. You can see how that could be not quite a fulfilling answer, if you will. Because you got to remember, for naturalists, a real naturalist can't think of anything. They, they, they can't offer up any ideas that come from outside of the natural world. So any answer they give you as to how we got here, as to why there's something rather than nothing, has to come from inside the natural world. The only answer that they can offer to the how did we get here question is to say we're here. So who cares how we got here? See, all of us make confessions of what we believe because we all believe in something. And in those systems of belief, uh, our worldviews, there are statements of what we believe in. And when we make those statements, when we decide what we believe, we live our lives according to those beliefs for better or worse. Now, no worldview is perfect. I just poked a, uh, 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 some holes in the naturalist worldview. You could have a naturalist poke some holes in a religious worldview. There's no doubt about that. No worldview is perfect. But the key question for any worldview, whether it's of a secular or a religious nature, is this. What is it that I do believe? That is a key question. It's important that you get your foundational questions right because everything else flows from their answers, such as how we should spend our money or questions such as what is the value of human life? How should I act? in any given moral or ethical situation. These are all informed by our worldview. That's why it's important to think about what you believe and why you believe it and how that affects your actions. So what do we believe? What do you believe? Well, what Christians believe is that God created everything out of nothing. We call this creation ex nihilo. When Christians confess that we believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we're confessing that we believe that we're here, not because of meteors or aliens. Again, you can keep walking that back into an infinite regress, but because God made us. And that if there are aliens who brought life to earth, guess what? God made them too. We're saying that the universe has a cause. It didn't just always exist, which by the way, has been proven by the Big Bang Theory, that the universe had a beginning. That there is a cause of the universe, and thus uh, there's a cause of us. And that cause is God. The Christian philosopher William Lane Craig uses an argument called the Kalam cosmological argument. Now, this is uh, an argument that comes from medieval uh, Islam 
and a scholar by the name of Al Ghazali. And, 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 and the argument goes something like this. Everything that begins, key word, begins to exist has a cause. Again, I'll bring you back. Notice it says begins, right? We begin with the idea that something doesn't just come from nothing, right? Like right now, you're watching this, and guess what? You are not worried at all that a horse is going to appear in your living room and start eating your furniture and pooping on your carpet. You know why? Because that's not going to happen. Because unless there's a mama horse in there who's about to give birth, ain't happening in, in your living room. Because something doesn't just come from nothing and so we know that there's a something there's a universe and we know it can't come from nothing now now back to that key word again began Genesis 1 1 makes it clear that nothing existed but God so anything that begins to exist has a cause but what if you were existence itself as is one of the properties that we, most religions, give to God. He's existence itself. So he doesn't begin to exist. He is existence. And so God does not begin, but everything else, however, does. God is not contingent. He just is. We are contingent. So we begin to exist. And so Nothing exists but God, and therefore, uh, in the beginning, and therefore, everything that begins to exist, according to the Kalam, has a cause. Then the second clause of the Kalam argument says, the universe began to exist. And again, I'm not going to beat the dead horse, just right back to uh, our... Our, our, our Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang Theory shows that the universe began to exist, that at some point in time, approximately 14.6 billion years ago or so, the universe came into existence based on background radiation data and the idea that all the planets are moving apart as if from a big explosion. So the universe began to exist. So from these two parts... Anything that begins to exist has a cause and, and the universe began to exist, we get the conclusion. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Christians call that cause God and they affirm their belief in God in the Apostles' Creed. So nothing existed but God, according to Genesis 1.1. There was no pre-existing matter to work with. We now know the universe was not always here, that it had a beginning. So God took nothing and made everything. And you can see that in the next lines of Genesis 1. Verse 2 says that once everything was made, it was chaotic. Much as the Big Bang Theory tells us the universe would have looked just after the bang. A lot of primordial things floating around, uh, uh, very chaotic, a lot of heat going off, uh, just things all over the place. A Hebrew metaphor for chaos that comes up time and again in the Bible is water. In a storm or a tempest, Water, especially large bodies of water, like the Mediterranean Sea, for instance, can be very chaotic. So Moses, the author of Genesis, uses the picture of chaotic waters, deep and formless, to show the early creation. But there, too, we find God. Because the Bible says the Spirit of God, what Christians call the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the chaotic waters, ready to begin forming the chaos into creation. And God speaks through his spoken word. Creation appears. The Bible repeatedly says in Genesis 1, let there be, and it was so. God creates light and darkness. There is sky and ocean. There is land. The land produces vegetation. 
God takes that sky and he puts the sun, the moon, the stars, all there, all created by him. The sea creatures are created to play in the sea and to live there. And the birds are created to fly and, and, and to make their nest in the vegetation, in the trees and vegetation. Next, God creates all of the land creatures to roam the land. All of the living things on earth, those sea creatures, those birds, those creatures on the land, God, God commands them and says, go and multiply and thrive. And that's what they do. And finally, God creates us. Aliens didn't create us. Meteors didn't carry life here. Ultimately, all of it was created by God. God created us in his image, male and female. That's how he made us. He made us to be just like him. The Bible says that God created everything out of nothing. You're here because God spoke into being rocks and trees and nitrogen and oxygen and water and birds and turtles and stars and moons and planets and most importantly, God spoke you into being. The world exists. The reason you got here is that God wanted it to exist. It continues to exist because God, as the creed tells us, is almighty and he sustains the creation. He keeps the whole thing running. God has the power to make this world and this universe and everything in it out of nothing simply by saying, let it be. Yet the creed does not stop at answering how we got here. Many worldviews. We, we looked at naturalism, which doesn't look for a creator outside of the box. But many worldviews say there is a creator. For instance, the philosopher Plato called the creator the demiurge that created everything seen and unseen. But the demiurge is not a personal God. You can't pray to it. The urge is just a creator. Who creates. That's it. Aristotle, Plato's student, said that the unmoved mover, which was his name for the creator, set everything in motion and then contemplates. The unmoved mover just sits there and contemplates how awesome it, it all is, how awesome he is. Yes, in Aristotle's philosophy, God, the unmoved mover, is a narcissist. He doesn't even know you exist and he doesn't care. He just focuses only on himself and how great and awesome he is. But here's where we're different. Jesus called the creator father. For Christians, God isn't just the creator. He's actually a personal God. He didn't just create us because he could. He created us to be in relationship to him. That's why the apostle John in his gospel, retells the story of Genesis chapter 1. See, in John chapter 1, John tells us that the word of God is actually a person. That word that speaks into his existence, and that person we call the Son. So in the very beginning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were at work creating everything. The word, John says, became flesh, and he dwelt among us. Why? So that he could give you the right to become children of God. That's what he says in chapter 1, verse 12. God loves you. And he created you to be his child. God isn't an impersonal creator. He's not a cosmic narcissist. And yes, there is a God. That God is your father. Why not spend some time this week, worshiping your father. One day this week, 
Go out and spend some time with the creation. Maybe take a walk early in the morning and, and pay attention to the trees and plants or birds. Or, or, or maybe if you live here in the Stanton area or, or, or in, in the Shenandoah Valley or you got mountains near you, go on, take a trip to the mountains and, and, and go for a hike and see the beauty of nature. Look out upon that creation uh, that God made from, from a great height. Get a God's eye view, if you will, of the creation. Sh sit in the shade of your backyard, right? For those of you maybe who, who aren't as mobile as you used to be, sit in the shade of your backyard and, and, and look at the creation from your rocking chair. Just in your backyard, just looking at grass and flowers and trees and bees, right? I got a lot of bees in my yard right now, a lot of honeybees. Watch the honeybee work for a little while and just marvel at, at, at the diversity of God's creation. Or even better, go out at night with a blanket and spend some time on your backside looking up at the stars. Maybe run around in the yard if you got some kids or grandkids and catch some fireflies. Whatever you do, enjoy it. Bask in this wonderful creation that God made. And when you're done, when you're ready to go in, I want you to thank God for creating everything. But most especially for creating you. World views are important. How you answer the big question often reflects how, we, how you and I, how we live our lives. See, if we don't believe in a creator or believe in a, in a, in a personal creator, we can be good people. There's no doubt about that. But we have no purpose above what we choose to give ourselves. However, if we affirm that God created everything out of nothing, then that changes everything. It means that he created us with a purpose in mind. That purpose is for God's glory to shine through us. It means that he created us with, 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 with love. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to do our best to love the Lord, to love him and do what he commands. Why? Because he loves us and he sustains us and he takes care of us because he's our father. He's the whole reason we're here. When nothing else existed, God did. He didn't need to make us. He's already perfect. He's already got this perfect union. He's his own community, right? He's three and yet he's one. He's a trinity. So he didn't mean to make us. He had all the love he wanted. He wanted to make us because that's what love does. He did it out of love. Love creates things. Love is a creative and powerful force. We were made for love. We were made for divine love. We were made to love. We were made to love God and to love each other. We were made that way from the very beginning. Amen. Would you all please join me uh, in a word of prayer and take to God all those things that are on your hearts and your minds, uh, your, your loved ones, your, your close relations, your family members, uh, people who are in need, you yourself in need, and then also those joys, those wonderful things that that, is, that are happening in your life and that we should praise God for. Let's take all that to the Lord in prayer. Center us now, O God, on your presence in this place among your people as we lift up our hearts, desires, our souls, deep needs, our hungers, fears, and failures. As we have often failed to be obedient to your will in our lives as individual disciples and as church, we pray that you will forgive us and enliven us to be and to do the gospel of Christ. Open us to your Spirit's urgings and awaken us to live faithfully as your people in a changing, often hurting world. We pray for those around us who need your care and ask that you would make of us your instruments of healing, peace, and redemption. We pray especially for those we have named to you this day and others we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. 
Reveal your presence with them and with us, God of life, that as people of renewed faith and vitality, we may be empowered to serve your world and so give glory to you. For we offer our prayers and our lives in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.